In this video, we're going to talk about how to build a custom deck, one that is not necessarily rectangular, one that has a border and railing system, and one that's basically designed to fit the needs of your home. And so for that, we'll start with a short presentation on the planning stage of the project involving concepts of deck building, code and procedures, tools you might need, how to design your deck, and some of the materials you might want. Next, we'll talk about the preparation stage, going into actual video of the project, and that involves the demolition of any existing structures, surveying the land, and earth moving. Then we'll talk about the construction stage of the project, starting with the foundation work, then framing and decking, the railing system and stairs. And finally, we'll talk about the completion stage involving skirting, landscaping, gates, lights and cameras, ceiling, staining, and furnishing. So we'll start with concepts here. Now you have to imagine that when you step out onto your deck, you're first setting foot on a deck board or a certain amount of deck boards, and that is supporting your weight. But what is supporting the deck boards, right? So the deck boards are supported by the joists, and so your weight is transferred first to the deck boards, then to the joists. And then what's supporting the joists? Well, if it's an attached deck, it's supported by a ledger board connection at the house. And there's also a beam supporting the joists. Now, what's supporting the ledger board? Well, the house itself. And what's supporting the beam? Well, posts are usually supporting that beam. Okay, well, what's supporting the posts? Well, there's got to be potentially that final connection to the earth, and a lot of times that involves a concrete footing. And so starting with that earth connection here, there's different ways we can transfer that amount of force to the earth. And keep in mind that the larger area for a given force is going to mean less pressure. So a lot of times we see designs of a larger uh, diameter footing here at the bottom. And so that's one major concept here. Another concept to think about is what soil type do you have? What's the climate that you're in? And so based on your soil type and climate, we're going to want to consider the frost line. And so if we have a cold climate here, the water that's in the soil is potentially going to be freezing down to a certain depth, the frost line. And we want to make sure that our connection to the earth is below that line. Because when water freezes, it expands. And as it expands, it will exert forces on your footing. And we really don't want that to be messed with. Now, the next thing to potentially consider here is how you're going to connect your post then to your beam. And so for that, we can use hardware that sits on top of the posts, or we can actually notch our posts as well. There's different ways of doing things. Also, you want to consider, is it an attached deck or is it a detached deck? Remember, if it's an attached deck, we have a ledger board connection. And we also have two ways, uh, popular ways to do the beam. We can have a dropped beam construction, which we're going to do here. Um, or we could have uh, a flush beam construction. Uh, with the drop beam, we can have that option of a cantilever, which we're going to have. Uh, we have the joists that are spanning a certain distance, right? And a lot of different concepts here involving the framing of a deck. Then we can move into the railing system. There's different ways to incorporate that. Uh, we can notch the railing posts, which is done quite often, even though it does weaken the post. Or we can incorporate the railing posts into the joists uh, here. Now we get into some more heuristics or rules of thumb for state-of-the-art construction. Remember we want to meet or exceed our local code and follow any procedures, uh, procedures involving permit or even procedures involving the materials that you buy and the product procedures of installation. And so one thing to consider is the joist spacing for your deck. And so I'm going with 16 inch on center. I'm using five quarter inch decking. Uh, I'm having my uh, decking perpendicular to the joist. It'll be different if it's diagonal. Also consider your joist maximum span, how much you're spanning with your joist. I'm using two by eight lumber. And so with a spacing of 16 inches on center, I don't really wanna be spanning more than 10 feet. Now, the other thing to consider is the beam span. And so for me, um, basically trying my best to keep uh, the beam span uh, about six foot or less. Um, and so the chart like this can help you determine that because in my situation, I'm going with a double two by eight beam. Another thing to consider is how high your posts, uh, if you want to build a pretty high deck, you definitely want to go with six by six posts. Um, I went with six by six posts anyway, even though I'm nowhere near 14 foot high. 
Yeah, another thing to consider is some of the code for railing. So guardrail should be about 36 to 42 inches in height. Uh, if you're going to go with more than two steps, uh, you should definitely have a railing system for your steps as well. Um, you want your railing posts to be six foot or less in terms of those spacings and then the gaps that are in your balusters um, and basically any uh, part of the guard system should be less than four inches. Okay, so now some of the tools you might want. We're going to want some earth moving tools like a digging bar, post hole digger, etc. Uh, we're also going to want some hand tools uh, as well and we're going to want some power tools, some saws, drills, etc. And so the other thing we want to consider is how we're going to design our deck. And for that, we can use different software. Uh, Menards, Lowe's, Home Depot has free software that you can use. I ended up using Menards, so I went on their website. I clicked on Design a Deck. Then what I did is I basically drew out um, how I wanted my deck uh, to be roughly. Now, because this is a custom deck, I did have to change this a little bit. And so what I did is I kind of um, took some screenshots here from their software, put it into Microsoft PowerPoint, and then I modified it a little bit. And I started to design where I wanted certain things on the deck and how I wanted things structured. Um, and so we end up with different pictures and, and you know d a different digital representation of, of how you want your deck to look. And so that's very important. And then we want to get into some specifics and, uh, you know, starting to take some specific measurements involved and trying to locate where you're going to want to, you know, dig your holes for your um, piers and, and footings and whatnot and uh, how you're going to structure your beam system, right? And, and that is going to really help us as we move forward and as we try to calculate materials and so on. And so then we'll kind of take it one step at a time. We'll look at our beams and posts and we'll kind of figure out how we want to structure that and we'll start to count up how many two by eights we need. Um, then we'll, we'll start to look at our joists and um, we'll start to plan out, you know, how we want our joists to run. Um, you can basically just add the material to the cart a lot of times on these uh, websites, but um, I find it useful to go through and actually plan it how you want it um, because sometimes, for example, in my situation, uh, they wanted me to run my joist and kind of stop it at the first beam and then continue it. I prefer to just run, a, you know, a, a straightforward, you know, 20 foot uh, joist instead of breaking it up. And so it is very helpful to kind of think about how you're going to be using your lumber before you buy it. Now, after thinking about the joists, we want to think about the decking and how many deck boards we're going to need and how we're going to configure them um, and start to count up and figure out how much material we need based on our design. And then we're going to do our calculations. We're going to figure out, you know, how can we uh, get the material that we need for the lowest cost um, and not have a bunch of waste, right? And so thinking about uh, how much rebar you might need, how much concrete, you know, um, thinking about how much decking you're going to need, how many 2 by 8s you're going to need, and so on. And then we're going to look at our material specifically, uh, and we're going to start to modify um, our needs here for our foundation. We're going to want those posts. We're going to want rebar, concrete, uh, sauna tubes, uh, anchor bolts, um, and then we're going to go with a, a post um, a post anchor bracket. And then... For framing, we're going to want a bunch of different size 2x8s, and that is going to be for the joists and for the beam. And then for framing hardware, we're going to want these you know, hurricane straps. We're going to want uh, these post cap brackets. We're definitely going to need some joist hangers. We're going to also need the decking, so we're going to go with 5 quarter inch decking here. Uh, the AC2 treated, so all the wood is treated wood. It's not just regular wood. It has to be treated. Um, then we're going to go with, you know, the material we might want for our railing. So we're probably going to need some two by fours, a handrail, um, some deck posts and spindles. Um, then we're going to want to look at what we need for our stairs. We might want some stair treads, uh, pre-made stair stringers, um, some stringer hangers, maybe some construction blocks. Um, then we're going to look at uh, the fasteners. How are we going to fasten all this stuff together? And so for me, I really love the GRK stuff. And so uh, we got some RSS, you know, big structural 
fasteners for the ledger board connection and then the majority of the framing will be done with these R4 you know framing screws now keep in mind that screws a lot of times don't have the shear strength required for certain applications and so that's why people use nails but remember with modern screw technology we've come a long way and so as long as you're using the proper fastener the proper screw like a GRK you're going to be fine you just need to make sure that you're you know doing your diligence to to pick the right fasteners and also that you're using fasteners that are rated for treating wood so they don't just uh, rust away. And so then we're going to have these carriage bolts and these uh, washers and nuts for the railing system. And we have these uh, joist hanger nails um, for a lot of the metal bracket connections. And uh, then you're going to want to decide how you're going to attach your decking boards. And so we could go with deck screws. I ended up going with the camo system later, um, but I'm basically going over my original order, uh, which was modified a little bit. I returned some things and bought some other things, but it worked out to be around the same cost here. And so finally, we talk about water management. We get some gravel and some, you know, landscaping fabric. We get some, you know, outdoor siliconized caulk. We get uh, some metal flashing. We get some basically this uh, self-adhesive flashing as well and then we have some wood preservative uh, for our cut ends and so for this project that you will be observing came out to around five grand um, but your mileage may vary now some tips we're going to go over as we go through this video covering them briefly we have some preparation tips we have foundation tips we have framing tips decking tips and water tips and so you'll see some of these tips uh, throughout the course of this video and let's get started. The more planning you put into the deck before you build it the better. It's also nice to have some help while you do it. One of the first things to do after planning is the preparation of the area which will include the disassembly of the current deck that is here and so for that we will be using a reciprocating saw and a hammer and a pry bar and so we'll get that done it'll also include some uh, raking uh, and removal of for example we had some wood stacked against the house and so just kind of maybe regrading things and so on you can cut the deck out in sections with the reciprocating saw this super sawzall with a nine inch wood with nails blade cuts through it like butter there's definitely some things we can learn from this old deck. Here, you see how the top of the joists are unprotected. They are prone to splitting and rotting. And you can also see that nails were used to fasten these deck boards. And so you can see the benefit of screws because the screws are a little bit less likely to pop up on you. Another thing to point out with the rot is on an area like this, especially since it's not protected, you can see how that just all rots over time and so we don't want water sitting there and not being able to dry and another thing you'll notice is that this is a detached deck and so over time what happens or what can happen is that it can pull away from the house you can kind of see how that's tilted from its original position and so if it's fastened properly with a ledger board that should prevent that from happening another thing that you'll see is that this is a 4x4 four four post and it's a 4x4 four four treated post I'll be using 6x6's uh, six but the, the main thing I'm trying to point out is that you can see that when you bury a post like this whether there's a footing or not I'm not sure but if you if you expose even treated wood like this into the ground you can see all this rot over time. There's very little structure left to this post here holding up the deck. And so that's just a few lessons here. So here's one of the posts. We'll see how deep they went and we'll see how sturdy this is. Ugh. Let's see if I can do it with one hand. Okay. So definitely you can see the rot happening. Um, we'll see down here what we find. We find some gravel. Um, so they put some gravel down. Um, doesn't look like any sort of a footing. Just to give you some perspective on the age, this house is about 28 years old. And clearly it looks like they had a nice little step down here, which we will try to move. Uh, and then they built the deck over the top of it. 
uh, at some later point in time. So that kind of gives you an idea about how old the deck was. Now, the other thing that they did to get around it is they notched these two by eights down real thin to get over to the top of that concrete. And so I want to try to avoid that and we'll see if we can move it. It looks like there's hope. I whacked a two by eight under there and then I'm using the crowbar for leverage and I'm able to move this huge concrete block. We're making some progress. I am going to use that leverage to flip it onto the flat side so it'll be a little bit smoother to move from that point on. So we were able to move that big chunk of concrete over. I tried to break it with a 10 pound sledgehammer but I think it's got rebar in it and it's not really doing anything to it. So I might just uh, slide it a little bit more down the hill and then kind of bury it under the, the new deck. But at least it's out of our way here for the new ledger board and uh, joists. And so you'll also see that I kind of marked roughly where the new posts are going to be. And we'll survey that after we're done with demoing. So the old deck is completely ripped out now, as you can see. And the goal now is to focus on surveying and to kind of grade and re-slope a lot of this dirt away from the house. Hello. Okay, so I used three foot little garden stakes to kind of mark where the posts are going to be. I ran some strings representing different distances and so this kind of represents the edge of one side of the deck then I also went about 10 feet in uh, made sure that those lines were square to each other I uh, used a framing square first to get it um, approximate and then I measured diagonally uh, and if the diagonal measurements are the same then you know it's square also you can use the three four five triangle method um, and so it's basically all about um, setting up your strings to be able to survey the land and mark your posts. Just remember since we're on uh, an uneven surface here it's nice to have a string that represents level and so you can buy one of these little string levels here and just kind of make sure that your string is pretty level um, and then you get some sort of like a plumb bob and then you just make marks on your line and with the plumb bob you go along and transfer that to the ground and it takes a little bit of time uh, but if you're patient and you do your measurements and you double and triple check uh, you can get it pretty good uh, now remember these footings are going to be 12 inches and the posts are going to be uh, six by six posts and so we do have a little bit of uh, leeway uh, so if it's off by like an inch or so it's not going to be the end of the world right now, uh, but we need to figure out where to drill our holes. Also, you'll see um, we basically exposed about uh, 12 inches of our wood foundation here. I'm going to come along with some ledger board flashing behind there, uh, and then we're going to put some landscaping fabric and gravel down. But we had to kind of re-grade uh, the, the area here, and it is very wet today, which Hopefully we'll make it a little bit easier to dig with the auger, uh, but it'll definitely be muddy. So we will start digging some holes in our locations. So I rented this little beaver auger and it basically is like this little engine cart thing that can pull behind you. And it is attached to this head here. And it is a single person auger. It's not too bad, um, there's different sized attachments that you can put on here. I got a smaller attachment because I might want to um, drill some pilot holes, but uh, eventually we do need to get the 12 inch holes. And it's about 36 inches. Uh, they do have extensions as well. Um, I am going to be trying to go down approximately 36 to 48 inches. Uh, there's really not a lot of code for the depth of the footings. Uh, in this area for decks, it, there's really nothing that guides your depth, uh, but I did look at what they expect for this area for attached and detached garages, and it's approximately 32 inches is what they're looking for, and so 36 should be plenty. 
uh, and I also did some research on the frost line for this area. The idea is you want to get below the frost line if possible. Uh, and so we will get this uh, attachment on here and we will start digging holes. We have 16 different holes to dig here. It'll be fun. So we took the strings down and you can also use some of this uh, marking paint, uh, which is nice as well. And just make sure you know exactly where you're drilling before you get this thing up into position. And we will get going. Just in case you're interested, some of these things are in pretty rough shape when you get them. And so uh, just to make sure that you're aware, uh, there's a switch right here and that has to be in the on position in order to start the engine. And then this right here um, is basically what tra uh, transfers the vibrations, this arm here. And this, when this connects in here, there's a little kill switch here. And so that's supposed to engage the kill switch. Here they have some duct tape, uh, otherwise the engine won't start. Uh, and then over here, you need to make sure it's in the uh, on position. This is what it looks like when it is set up. I want to make sure to do the best that I can uh, to dig down, you know, vertically plumb uh, since we are on an incline. I am not going to do the pilot hole. The trick with the big one is just to go down a little bit until it kind of gets stuck almost and then you lift it up, let it clear the hole, down, up, down, up, especially since the soil is kind of wet and it's clumping, it's a little bit more difficult. But once uh, I started to do that technique, it was a lot easier. So um, we still have to get this one unstuck, but uh, as long as you don't run into too many roots, um, it's not too bad. So roots are really fun, especially big ones like this. So uh, in this case, you either cut out the root or you move the hole. And so I think uh, since it's not too uh, far out of position, I might just move the hole a little bit. Well, there's also the possibility where you have roots above, below, basically everywhere. And so this root is just gonna have to go. Uh, I'm gonna cut it with the reciprocating saw here and here, and then it'll leave room for the footing. So the super sawzall makes pretty quick work of it. Just cut it on either side and pull it right out. And then hopefully we can uh, just kind of continue digging there without any issues. So we're about half done and this is what it looks like. We still got to do this one, that one, that one, that one. <laughs> but uh, it's going pretty well now. Uh, well, we are doing about, let's say three holes at a time and then we're just kind of giving the machine a break. It's getting a little hot and we're, we get a little tired after. So, uh, but it's coming along pretty good. Uh, we're basically going down and then up. Uh, and if we run into a root or a rock, we stop. And then I use like the crowbar, the shovel, uh, or the reciprocating saw to kind of clear a path and loosen it back up and then we go down deeper So it's looking pretty good so far. Let's finish this up All of the holes are dug now with the auger What we have to do now is deepen a few of the holes and clean up all of the loose dirt at the bottom as well as expand the bottom of each hole just to kind of have a little bit of a mushrooming effect of the footing and that will help resist the footing uh, from pulling out and it'll also expand the load over a greater area at the bottom. And so for that I will use a post hole digger and a digging bar and we will prepare for the pouring of the concrete here. Get all the holes nice and tidied up. You can see all this loose dirt at the bottom of each hole and so if you leave that there you're just asking for the footing to sink uh, if it's not on undisturbed ground. You can see how I'm trying to dig out a little bit on the bottom of the hole so that when the concrete goes in the tube it can kind of overflow a little bit and create a larger diameter mushroom at the bottom like I was saying. Also uh, even after you're done clearing the loose dirt you can use the back of this uh, digging bar and you can use it to compress what's left and you'll be surprised with how much you can compact it uh, before you pour the, the footing. The other thing you should do is make sure that your holes are all in the right place and so one of the ways to do that is to run a straight line and try to figure out if the footings are going to be directly under 
that straight line where you want them to be. And you can always make minor adjustments to the holes if needed. Now that the holes are all cleaned up, I am loosely placing these concrete forming tubes in the holes and I have to figure out how long each one has to be so that I can cut it to length. I am using number four half inch rebar to reinforce the concrete uh, footings and piers and I'm using a angle grinder to cut it uh, with a metal cutoff wheel. It's really not that expensive. You can get it uh, in 20 foot lengths for under 10 bucks and it doesn't take that much time to cut through it. I'm cutting these pieces in about 30 seconds and so it will definitely help absorb the stress uh, in that concrete and if there is a crack it'll help hold uh, it together and manage the crack especially lateral stresses from wind and whatnot. This anchor bolt also has to go into the concrete and so you'll see with this bracket uh, you can't have it sticking up too much out of the concrete otherwise that um, plate won't be able to sit on top. And so what I did is I got it on there in a decent spot and then I marked it uh, underneath uh, just with a, a sharpie marker and I can transfer that mark to the other bolts and then I know approximately how I need to set them in the concrete. It might be hard to see, but the laser is set up to basically represent the bottom of the siding, which is the finished deck. And we have to account for the five quarter inch uh, decking, uh, the two by eight joist, and then also the, the two by eight uh, beam, because it's a drop beam construction. And then also you have the metal bracket and six by six post, which is at least three and a half inches. And so I need to go at least um, 20 inches down, I would say, uh, to be safe. And so you'll see that line marked here. And then I'm just going to measure down from that line, uh, you know, 20 inches. And so we'll start here and then we'll go down 20 inches, we'll mark it. And then that's where we need to cut the, the tube. After we cut it, we're going to flip it upside down so that the factory edge is facing up and that'll give a nice finish to the top. So there's the mark 20 inches down and notice how that gets us to about four inches off the ground. And so that's kind of where you wanna be. You want your piers to stick out of the ground at least a few inches. Uh, even though the, the metal post uh, bracket is going to lift up your post a little bit more too, uh, you definitely want your post lifted up um, away from the snow and the weather uh, to avoid rotting. So you'll see that that laser line is at that 20 inch mark and so we are about 20 inches down from the siding as planned and I just cut it with the sawzall. It really doesn't have to be pretty uh, because you're putting the messy edge down and you're keeping the factory edge up. You can use some backfill to help stabilize the tube. You want to continue to check to make sure that the tube is level in both dimensions this way and also that way. For each footing and pier, I'm going to approximately need five bags of 60 pound concrete. Uh, we are also going to use four pieces of vertical rebar um, along with that anchor bolt. I uh, have a trowel there uh, once we get towards the top uh, to make it nice and smooth. Uh, there is a mixing boat here to mix the concrete one bag at a time uh, with the hose and the hoe and basically we are going to pour one bag at a time in here and put just enough water so that there's no powder left but not too much water you definitely don't want to overwater it another tip is just to use the hoe to open the bags by hitting it and then you can easily lift up the bag and pour it into your mixing boat as you can see here we definitely still need more water and so you can see how parts of the mix are wet but we still have dry spots and so after we mix it all around if you still see that dry powder, we definitely need more water. This is pretty much what it looks like when it's ready to go. And now we will dump it into the hole. Once you get to this stage, you can put your vertical rebar in. You just gotta shove it in like that and make sure it's not too close to the edges or to the top. And you can also take a board or piece of wood and just kind of mix, mix it around and compact it and try to get rid of any pockets that are there 
and you can also use a the back of a sawzall to vibrate it as well. You can also use a nice clean shovel to scoop the remainder in. When we get to the top here, I am going to use a trowel to flatten it out and then also the sawzall to vibrate it. You can see this. And those vibrations will definitely help fill in all those little nooks and crannies that are not as of now. As you vibrate it, you will start to see some air bubbles pop up and that's a great thing. Also, once you get towards the end, you can kind of screed it with a board to try to get it as level as you can. So we have the string level coming out square from the house and we put the plumb bob on our eight foot mark and that's gonna go down and make a little bit of a mark for us. And that mark represents where the anchor bolt needs to be. And as you can see, it's very close to the center. It doesn't necessarily have to be exactly in the center though. All right, so let's put our anchor bolt in and we will just push it down. And we have a mark here to figure out exactly how much exposed threads we need. And so we'll just keep going down with it. And we get to about here. You also might find it easier to make adjustments to the bolt uh, with the pliers, and so we can kind of just grab onto it and uh, make sure it's as plumb as we can get it. And you can also kind of shake it around a little bit up and down, and that'll help the concrete as well um, settle around our anchor bolt. This is how it turned out. I put the bracket on there temporarily just to show you how it looks, and the exposed threads uh, seems to be plenty. Uh, and we also need to fit this um, cap on here. So one is done. We still have 15 more to be done very similarly. Uh, the good news is though, uh, the ones that are along the house, uh, eight feet away from the house, are the only ones where I have to kind of worry about that 20 inches of drop. Uh, because we are on a slope here, all of the other ones, I don't really have to worry about that and use the laser level. And so I will just be basically coming out of the hole about four inches and calling it a day uh, for those ones. And time to grab some more concrete. This is fun. It's always good to have an inspector on site. And also a concrete mixer on site. Over half done now with the footings and piers. And so a couple tips here. One is you can take the tarp that a lot of times just comes with the lumber and just cut it up into little squares and put it over the top if it starts to rain uh, because uh, that inevitably will happen. <laughs> and also, uh, you don't have to put the sano tubes all the way to the bottom. You can lift them up and allow room for that concrete to expand out into that footing area. And you can just take some of your larger backfill and pin the sano tube in place where you want it, uh, not necessarily at the bottom of the hole. And uh, when you're done, uh, make sure you compact as you can see, I'm uh, doing it here. Uh, compact all of the backfill down, make sure it's nice and compressed. Another thing is on your straight section, so I'm gonna have basically a beam running all the way there, and then this is going to be a double two by eight by 20 beam uh, right here. And so notice how all of my bolts are basically in the exact position that they need to be and that's important. When the concrete is done you can peel off the concrete forming tube that's above ground. As you can see here I did pretty good vibrating that concrete. Over here you will see that I didn't do as well and so it's really not the end of the world but it just goes to show you how important it is to vibrate that tube. So the footings and piers are done now. We're coming back and putting the metal brackets on top. Uh, we have this ledger board flashing going up. And so the trick with this is to try to get it underneath the siding and behind the house wrap. So any water that gets behind the siding uh, will kind of follow the house wrap down and come on top of this. Uh, and it just provides a nice little bit of extra protection behind the ledger board. And then we come through with some landscaping fabric and gravel. We're gonna come out probably at least uh, nine feet with the landscaping fabric and gravel. And we 
are working our way down here preparing for the ledger board and you'll kind of see how that looks. Some of the areas are going to need some caulk as well and we're also going to come uh, along with some metal flashing too. This is what the post and ledger board flashing looks like. It just comes in a roll and you just unstick it as you go and force it up underneath the siding. There's a gutter right here and also a gutter right here and so what we're going to do is move the gutter over as far as we can and just kind of get it out of the way and then start the deck so we don't have the gutter going through the deck. So the gutter's pretty much moved over now. All you really have to do is move these brackets over and then just make sure to fill the holes with some silicone. So we got the ledger board propped up on some bricks right now. We're trying to figure out exactly where we have to drill this hole uh, in the ledger board. So I have it marked left to right where the hole needs to be, but now in terms of the vertical dimension, we have to measure down to see where that pipe is and then account also for the width of the decking. After you know where the hole needs to go left and right and up and down, you basically just grab a hole saw and drill your hole. As you can see, the hole is now drilled and we still have enough room for our decking board with just a little bit of a space below the siding. And so we are going to go along and make sure the board is level and we have the spacing correct. And we are going to attach the ledger board to the house with these structural screws, uh, the RSS GRK fasteners. And it is um, wonderful for different applications. It even says on here, uh, ledger board for a suggested use. You also have the metal flashing that sits on top of the ledger board and it needs to get up behind that siding. And so that might actually be easier to put on before the ledger board. We will also use some exterior siliconized caulk. And so for that, we wanna make sure to get under the door, uh, any penetrations in the house. And uh, that includes uh, from when we moved the gutter over. And so this stuff is clear. Uh, you won't really notice it. And it'll give you a little bit of extra protection. So once you get your flashing in, you can tack your ledger board in with some screws and then you just slide a deck board as a spacer and just kind of keep it a quarter inch below the siding and that should work uh, for the positioning of the ledger board. When you run your next piece of flashing, make sure to overlap it by at least a few inches. And in order to cut this, uh, I'm just using some tin snips. Keep some wood preservative with a spare paintbrush close by to the saw because every time you make a cut into the treated wood, uh, it's good to seal that end. It's possible that you expose some untreated wood that needs to be treated. So the ledger board and the flashing is pretty much done now. As you can see, uh, we marked the end joist here and then all the other joists are basically 16 inches on center. And so you just uh, follow the red marks on your tape measure every 16 inches, put a mark, put an X to the right of it um, to represent uh, where the joist is actually going to be. And then in terms of uh, kind of screwing in uh, with the structural screws, uh, you can first tack it in with the smaller screws, but then uh, I've been staggering them and basically putting two of them uh, inside each uh, joist cavity. And so that is done basically all the way around. Now that the ledger board is all in, we are starting on getting the posts and the beam system built. To figure out the measurements for the posts, you hold the string to the bottom of the ledger board and pull it tight. That re basically represents the bottom of the joist. And then you make sure that that string is level. And you come over here and you take your reading, but you're not measuring from the metal. You're measuring from a two by eight, which represents the beam, which is sitting on top of the metal. And that'll tell you how high the posts have to be. So we are using a 12 inch miter saw to cut as much as we can through it, but it doesn't quite get all the way through. So if you have a guard on your saw, you kind of have to lift it up and get it out of the way. And you can hold it with a thumb that's operating the miter saw, and then you let the blade do all the work, keep your hands away from it. And so we'll get that.
And so after that, we take the Super Sawzall and I have a, uh, a Diablo uh, fast clean wood carbide teeth blade and that gets through the rest of it really quickly. So with the reciprocating saw, uh, you keep this foot right against the wood to help with the vibrations. You go down right in that slot that you created and you just finish it off real quick. If you don't have some of the tools, obviously there's other ways of doing things. For example, you could use a handsaw here to, to finish through that cut. And then after that, I sand it. You can see how it's pretty good, but we can just take a sander and clean it up a little bit. And then after that, take it over here and we treat it with some of this uh, wood preservative. So then we'll just take that wood preservative with a scrap paintbrush and just let it soak in to that cut end. We need to make sure that this bracket is where we want it and then tighten it down. And we're gonna tighten it to the point where it doesn't really move at all on the top of this footing. And then we put on this little riser plate here and it's ready for a post. When you're installing the post, you gotta do the best that you can to make sure that it's plumb in both directions. And so for that, you can kind of rotate the post within the bracket and sometimes that'll help you get closer. And then as you're installing the brackets on the bottom and the top, just do the best that you can to make sure that your post is plumb in both directions. The goal is to attach the beams to the tops of the posts with as many brackets and fasteners as you need to to make a nice sturdy beam system. And so this is kind of what it looks like. We're running two ply, um, you know, double two by eights as the beam. Down here you'll see an example of one of the nice brackets that can be used. And over here, same deal. And this is a 40 foot beam section. This is a 20 foot beam section. You get a little bit more complicated when you get over to this area here where you know you might have to make some more angled cuts and whatnot. Uh, you also might want to use some different brackets uh, like some of these rafter ties uh, definitely help create a more stable platform. Also here, a nice little notch feature that I have. Uh, keep in mind, whenever you're notching the board, you are weakening it, so you definitely want to be careful. Uh, but the way that I did this with the notch, it's definitely nice and strong. Uh, when you push on this edge of the board, um, it's basically clamping in the torque that I that's being generated from a downward force here is clamping in on that, so that's not really a big deal. Uh, whereas this one is the one that's a little weaker because any downward force on this is going to try to split open the notch. And so throwing some extra screws and some hardware in there will help, but it only has to hold one um, joist here about a foot away. Uh, so it really is not uh, crazy uh, in terms of the load bearing that it's going to need to be able to withstand. Another tip here is that as you're placing these, we wanna make sure the crown is up. And so sometimes the board has a little bit of a, a rise to it as you look down the board. Um, and so you wanna make sure the crown is up so the weight over time uh, can lower that instead of a valley. And so those are a few tips here as we put this beam system together. You also wanna make sure to stagger the seams in your beam and also make sure that the seam is at the center of a post, not just hanging out there anywhere. If you're careful with the construction of your beam, it should come out fairly level. Uh, keep in mind, we do want it to be sloped slightly away from the house, uh, maybe about a quarter inch every eight foot. Uh, also, it's, it's possible that if you run into a situation where it's really off, 
uh, you might have to recut one of the posts and that actually happened out of the 16 posts I had to recut one of them uh, it was about an inch too low for some reason luckily I had a whole bunch of extra six by sixes so uh, definitely make sure that this step is right uh, we're building from the foundation up your beam should be fairly plumb as well you want to make sure that your two different two by eights that form the beam are fastened together kind of in a stagger pattern all the way you can use the circular saw for a lot of the cuts uh, but you can also come along with the sawzall and cut through the entire beam at one time uh, especially for those angled cuts it makes it nice and easy all right so the notches are cut and treated we'll see how it fits here almost nice and tight here One thing you're probably going to want to do is use some deck flash barrier on top of your beams. You'll notice that there's a, a seam here and water can get down there and even though it's pressure treated wood, it can rot over time. So it's a nice extra layer of protection. After you're done with the beams, make sure your worksite is clean, pick up any loose debris you got under the deck and then start bringing out the joists. Once you pretty much get all of your joists uh, set down in place about where they're going to be, uh, we can start to get our hardware out. And so what we have here is a, a joist hanger. Uh, this will be the majority of what we use uh, to attach to the ledger board. Uh, but we do have four of these. And so this is a joist hanger as well, but it's, uh, it's meant to kind of go at the ends. And so at the end of the ledger board there, there, there and there so that's why I need four of them uh, they're a little bit of a different style we also have here these uh, hurricane straps or rafter ties and that's going to be used to attach um, the joists to the beam uh, at these locations here these one and a half inch hot dip galvanized joist nails work pretty well what you're gonna want to do is flip up your joists one at a time and then kind of look down the board and see if we can find where the crown is. You can kind of see how this dips down. It definitely up on the other side comes up. And so usually we want the crown facing up for these. So don't forget that. Do the best you can to keep your joists plumb. And you'll see uh, that we're pretty good here with the joists in terms of keeping the slope away from the house as I lift up on the level. Um, you'll see that it moves into that level position. So we're slightly at a slope away from the house, which is good. Also, uh, we have a framing square here. And so, as you can see right now, uh, we are not square to the house. And so we can get our joists fairly square and then we'll square everything up at the end as well. Also, over here, notice how with a framing square, one of the sides is 16 inches so you can see how you can kind of use that um, as a spacing and then the other side is 24 inches um, and then the last thing here as we put our joist hangers on remember this is the unique one on the end uh, we want to have the top of the joist line up right with our flashing because uh, our deck board is going to sit uh, on that flashing and so we want this to be flush at the top and these are the other types of joist hangers and we basically need to figure out uh, where to put them so that the joist will fall in the correct position. You can use a scrap uh, joist to kind of get yourself in a good position and then you can hammer in these little tabs on the joist hanger and that'll hold it in position for you. Just keep in mind that all of these joists are slightly different. They're all about seven and a quarter but they can vary a little bit and so you just want to keep that in mind as you're doing this. But it does kind of help get you roughly positioned using a smaller piece of wood rather than the entire joist. The way that we have this marked we're lining up our joists the left side of them with this line and the X represents where the actual joist is. Remember that this connection to the ledger board is keeping your deck from pulling away from the house and so uh, you can see how these nails aren't that long. You do need a fastener in, in every hole basically, um, but notice how on these joist hangers there's basically an angular um, hole and so that is probably a better spot for a longer fastener. I'm going to use uh, a GRK uh, framing screw 
and that'll get uh, in there at an angle and get all the way you know pretty deep into that ledger board and make a good attachment. Sometimes it's easier to get the joist hangers into position and then flip the joist up and in uh, or you can basically toenail um, the joists uh, where you want them and then come up underneath uh, with the bracket after the joist is in place. So there's definitely different ways to do this. So we have a lot of our joists up now. We want to make sure that this deck platform is square to the house with the framing. And so one way to do that is to measure, you know, huge diagonals and make sure that those diagonals are equal and that will tell you that it's square. Uh, another way is to use a fairly big version of the 345 method. Uh, so I'm basically multiplying my 345 by 4 and then I get a 12 16 20 triangle. And so I'm going to come out uh, all the way here to 16 uh, feet and I'm going to measure uh, 12 foot that way and then if, if it's a right triangle which we're trying for we're trying to make it square it'll come out here at this diagonal to be 20 feet so basically you have a baby hold the tape measure at 12 foot over there and then you just check to make sure that your diagonal meets up with your 16 uh, foot mark right at 20 feet and then you know that you are square. After we know that each joist is in its correct position it's already attached at the ledger board so we just need to make sure that we attach it to the beams uh, at both locations uh, with these hurricane straps or rafter ties here. You'll also notice that at certain locations the beam and the joist are not quite touching and so you might just have to push it down uh, before you install the strap. What I do so that I'm not banging on my joist that's in a good position is I first nail a few into the beam uh, in the proper position on the joist and that'll hold it in a decent position and then I come in and nail into the joist to make sure you have a nail for every hole. We have two straps here and here. We have to continue our way down and periodically check for square, make sure we're doing good. When we're installing these rafter ties, ideally you want to put one on one side and one on the other side. It'll just give you a little bit more uh, support. At six foot out from the house, it gets a little bit complicated. It starts to angle out uh, four feet this way and it comes to rest uh, four feet this way. And so I basically went and marked uh, 10 feet uh, and squared that up there. And then uh, there, that represents our uh, angle right here that we need to cut and put a, a nice end joist on. I decided to do some angled cuts here uh, for this cap board and you'll see that that one was cut at an angle here to match up there and then we got an angle here an angle here then i actually mitered it uh, so that it'll look real nice here and for that i just used the circular saw and put it on a 45. again don't forget to seal any end that you cut at every connection right here i am fastening it with four GRK screws. We're adding another joist here for the border that's gonna go on the deck, but you'll notice that this joist cavity is very small, and I can't fit my drill down in there, and you really can't fit a hammer down in there, and so an attachment like this basically might help you. Um, so we have a, a long extender here, we got a right angle attachment, and then I have another extender, and so with that we can get right down in there. and. Tighten our screw. We're installing these railing posts now and what we want to do is have from the finished height of the deck we need to have up to the top of the railing about 36 to 42 inches usually and so once you get the post in the right place for us we're just basically putting it flush at the bottom of each joist uh, then we can screw it into position and as we screw it into position with four GRK screws just to kind of hold it there uh, we're making sure that it is plumb on both sides and after that I'm coming through with a one and an eighth inch bit just to drill a little bit of a countersink for this bolt head and then I'm switching over to 
uh, a, a half inch uh, paddle here and we are going to drill all the way through and you can see how this bolt basically is going to go all the way through and then get a washer and a nut on the other side and we'll have two of those bolts. Uh, we can also use some uh, wood glue as well, some uh, exterior wood glue. This stuff is awesome and we can get a really really sturdy railing post. You can see here we have the wood glue uh, to help prevent that water getting down into that seam and we're basically just pounding these carriage bolts through and you can also see how it's nicely countersunk so if we want to come over with some skirt board we can and over here you just hit it with a washer and a nut. This next railing was a little bit tricky we had to go through at an angle uh, but we still made it work and it's still really really sturdy. So we have the first five posts up notice how the posts are in for the staircase the staircase should have at least 36 inches, so three feet of leeway uh, for people to be able to walk through. And you'll notice how it was definitely a little bit tedious. We, we're going to have an angled cut here for the railing in order for this to work. Uh, but you'll kind of get a general idea of how this was done here. Because uh, this was definitely took a little bit of time for sure. It's time to install the deck boards, starting with the border. You can see all the different styles of end grain. The key idea here is that when you see a frown, that's bad, and when you see a smile, that's good. And so when we install the deck boards, we want to do it so that you have the smiley side up. And that's because what will happen with the smile is you'll have a maybe a little bit of crowning over time, which will help shed the water off of the deck board, rather than with this frown, if we have the it facing like this, it'll form a little bit of a valley, and then you'll get water trapped on that deck board. One thing you want to consider with treated wood is the moisture level, because if you install the deck boards really wet, they can shrink as they dry and leave gaps maybe bigger than you expected. And so some people, if they're installing wet decking, they'll just butt the deck boards right up next to each other and let the gaps form naturally. Another thing you want to consider is how you're fastening your deck boards. And so you can go with more of a traditional approach with deck screws, and you can put the deck screws right through the face of the board. Or we can go with more of a modern uh, hidden fastening system one of which uh, being the camo system and in this system you have your spacing uh, kind of given for you uh, which is nice as you go uh, by these little you know metal tabs that come down and space it properly for you and then you have screws uh, proprietary screws that you know pop in uh, with a special drill bit and it basically screws at an angle and you won't, won't really see the fasteners after they're screwed in. With this border, you're probably going to have to make some notches around your post, and so for that, uh, I basically determined that the spacing between the deck boards and the flashing is going to be approximately a quarter of an inch, which I'm using my uh, construction pencil for. I just pop that in there, get that spacing. Then we want to mark where our posts are uh, in both locations, and then we want to figure out our overhang. Uh, the most that I would use is uh, basically a 2 by 8 and that's just in case you want to come down uh, with some extra scrap deck boards with some skirting and so I basically put that under there and then uh, you know took my tape measure and measured and that's going to tell me um, how I have to you know make that notch how big that notch has to be you can use a speed square to extend those lines for the notch cuts what you can do is use a circular saw for the straight cut and then come back in with a jigsaw to get the rest of the notch. The first piece of border is almost done now. You can see with the overhang, you can come in with some scrap deck board and create some skirting or do something else like lattice. And you also see how it gets a little bit complicated here. Uh, basically, we're just cutting this on a 45 and then the other piece comes in nice and flat as you can see. And so just figuring out how to have that uh, work. Uh, is a little bit time consuming, but definitely make sure that this step is correct. One tip to get some nice square cuts when you're cutting with a circular saw is basically to use the speed square as a guide as you're cutting. So we cut the four inch flashing tape in half to get basically two inch strips, and then we're using those to cover the tops of the joists. And you can see here how we're coming in with some bridging. Uh, 
and that'll definitely strengthen up the frame. We're also going to come in with bridging about halfway through uh, to connect the joists together. And don't forget uh, when you're doing your cuts to make sure that you treat the cut end. Notice how any screws that will be showing a little bit on the exterior potentially, you can just drop a square and get all your screws in a line. And the other thing is to point out with this extra framing, it gives us a spot uh, to basically have the deck boards hang over a little bit and then any water that gets in there will just go right down and drain very nicely. And this bridging that we're putting in here gives us a nice additional support for the border board. This joist cavity is going to have to support a perpendicular board to divide the deck into sections. And so what we'll do is run blocking basically all the way uh, down this joist cavity, approximately 16 on center. This is what the perpendicular board is gonna look like here. And you can see how we have the bridging in there to support it. And then the decking comes in and overhangs a little bit. The water can easily drain. And then the decking on the other side is gonna come in and do the same thing. We're installing the border board here. And for this, we basically just face screwed into this first joist here. And then when it comes to the second uh, screw, screw location into the bridging, uh, we can drop a screw into this little camo jig and then just screw it at an angle. And the screw hole basically is very hidden. You can see one right there. I'm going to glue, pre-drill, and screw these miter joints together. After the border's in, we can come in with our first deck board here. And we're going to start with a full deck board, and we will eventually finish it out there also with a full deck board. I'm using the jig to get these angles started on the first board so that when I push that first board in there, I only have to face screw once instead of twice. So we're set up basically for this first deck board. We have a 3 16 inch uh, drill bit to do the spacing here for the border and the camo system has the spacing built into it after that which is nice but what we'll do is secure the board on this end and on that end and then we'll pull a string nice and tight because the board is not perfectly straight we'll get our first board nice and straight and perfect and then all the other ones will be great after the first board is in you just get your 3 16 inch spacing here and then for me, I'm using the camo system, so I just load one screw in each side, drill it down there with the special bit provided. It gets it perfect. You don't have to worry about uh, over countersinking it. And then as you go down, you'll see how we got to do you know a little bit of prying to get it perfect, uh, but it's not too bad. When you get to a point where you really need to pry on a board to get it into position, you can screw in a temporary board and then use a pry bar in order to move it into position. Sometimes the boards aren't square from the factory too, so just make sure you check them. And then I was using a speed square just to trim the edge off and treat it just so that this gap here at the border looks really nice. You'll see I have a row of bridging here, which really strengthens the whole frame. When you inevitably drop one of your expensive screws under the deck, you can use your magnetic tape measure and rescue it. So this is the progress so far. I came up to about here with the border and I came up to about here with the decking boards. I'm gonna leave these decking boards loose for now. I'm gonna turn my attention to the other side of the deck and I want it to turn out fairly symmetrical. So uh, you'll see that all of these joists are tied down now all the way. We still have to add the blocking in here also, you'll see around the air conditioning unit, I doubled up here for an additional border and also have these posts uh, roughly in here with four GRK screws. I still have to come through with the carriage bolts. Uh, you'll also see here that because I have a significant overhang from the beam, I 
have to install some additional supports here. So I used some joist hangers and I came across with a board. Uh, that way this is nice and sturdy. These are also about 12 inches on center too. So nice and sturdy little jut out here for the air conditioning unit. And got some deck boards laying here starting on this side. And periodically I check to make sure that the boards are straight and not getting curved on me. I'm using a chalk line and just holding it on either corner of the board and then just kind of following it, making sure that that string is straight. Periodically, I'm measuring from the house on either side to make sure that I'm running parallel to the house as well. One of the most efficient ways I've found to do the decking that's pretty easy on your back and knees is basically just to have a pad that you kneel on and then have your crowbar and screws there that can slide along with you. And then you have your you know, drill and camo system and you just move from joist to joist pretty efficiently. One thing you can do also to pull the boards closer together is stick your pry bar in one of the gaps farther away from it and then just use a clamp to pull it tight towards you. Some deck boards might be in really rough shape and even structurally unsound. And so when you have a big crack like this, it's definitely worth not using that board and getting a different one. So I'm measuring in from that side to see when these boards are going to terminate here and I'm doing the same thing over on this side. What I need to do is then center this 20 foot two by eight as an end cap. And in order to do that, I need to cut the ends of these joists to make room. And I wanna make sure to run a chalk line all the way across so that I know exactly how much to cut off of the end of each joist. And I also want to make it so that my spacing is nice to allow for a good overhang on the last deck board so that I don't have to cut the last deck board. So I measured eight and a half inches out on both sides for my chalk line. I snapped it and then I'm using a speed square and a pencil to extend that line down. I'm going to cut this two by eight to exactly 20 feet with a speed square as a guide and a circular saw. Now I centered this 2x8 on my termination marks on either side and that'll tell me exactly how many of these joists to cut off to length. We'll use a circular saw with a speed square as a guide again to cut these joists to length. All of my joists are cut to length. What I want to do now is treat the ends and install this 20 foot rim joist centered on my marks fastening it with four GRK framing screws per connection. You can screw a scrap board to the bottom here to help you hold up this rim joist. As this end joist is being screwed in, you want it flush at the top. You can see how here we're gonna have to lift up on this end joist until it's flush and it'll basically even out all of these joists. The rim joist is installed now, as you can see, when I come on with an additional two boards, it's gonna give me a really nice overhang. What I can do now is use this 20 foot joist as a marker to figure out where I need to start going at an angle on both sides there. And then I can also come in and put my posts here as well now. After measuring 196 inches from the edge, I found my line where I wanna cut it and I squared it up and I snapped a chalk line here, and I did that also on the other side. And so what I'll do now is come through with my circular saw and cut this perfectly to length on both sides. We wanna set the blade depth so that it just barely goes through the board. So we can adjust it here down until it just hits right about there, and then it'll take us all the way through that board. So the cut is done. Now I'll just come through with a razor blade and just kind of finish it off. When I get close to the house here, I'm gonna finish it with a jigsaw and an oscillating saw. This divider board is done now. You can start to see the finished look. I decided to come in with additional structure as well here uh, because I wasn't comfortable with the flex I was getting from this overhang on these boards. And so we'll finish that, and then we can get the middle of the deck done. You'll also see how I started to get these posts in, and I had to put in a little bit of extra structure for those as well, uh, just to get them in nice and tight. I'm going to install this divider, and then butt up most of the factory ends to that, so that I don't have to cut them. And then over at this end, 
you'll see that I can kind of let them go wild and I just loosely rough cut them for now and at the end I'll cut a nice slot for that last divider board. As we go we want to make sure that the gaps are basically perfectly lined up the best that we can so we have to do a little bit of fudging every now and then with the spacing and also sometimes swap a board that's a little bit wider than another but it's definitely worth it to have the finished look. The other divider board is in now after the middle of the deck was completed. In order to do that we stopped right about here and we left um, these two deck boards loose and then we installed the final deck board where we wanted it and then we evenly spaced uh, the additional two uh, to finish it up with a nice full deck board against the house. With these jut outs here I basically cut at 45 degrees on both sides and I'm running the deck boards kind of like I did before so that I finish with a full deck board and so I'm running again with the eight and a half inches uh, for the cut line that will allow me a nice overhang after that end joist is put in. Now that the cuts are made we will treat them and install this rim joist here with four GRKs each connection so it's fastened on the other end remember on each joist I'm going to be lifting it up until it's flush now that this end joist is in I'm going to install the two posts and for that we do need some additional bridging so the extra bridging is installed for this post now and we'll move on to the other one the two posts for the jet out are installed and notice how I'm going to cut with a circular saw after marking with a chalk line for my diagonals all at the same time leaving room for the border so this is how the cut turned out I finished up with the jigsaw and the oscillating saw near the ends. Doesn't take too long to finish that up. It's time to start building this railing here. And what we need to do first is measure between the posts here. I have 68 inches for this one. We also want to double check to make sure our posts are plumb in both dimensions. And we also want to come and check how high we want our finished railing to be from the, from the deck. So I really don't want to go above 41 inches because then I start getting into this detail here. So I'm probably going to stick right around 40 inches or less in terms of the overall height. We want to stick to at least 36 inches high from the finished floor uh, to stick within a lot of code. Uh, but that's definitely what you want to figure out first. I have the railing mocked up here. Basically the idea is that we don't want any spaces greater than four inches. And so to accomplish this with the balusters, I turned a tape measure upside down. I marked the back of it every four inches. And so I will have a baluster every four inches on center. And I can just slide the tape measure and uh, get a nice symmetrical result uh, without having to do any math. You can also calculate with some math uh, your spacing for every single length of railing. Or you can just put your balusters up, and if you don't care about symmetry, just make sure that there's no gap greater than four inches. On the bottom here, I'm using a two by four, which will be sitting on the deck, and that's about three and a half inches uh, for the spacing to give me my sweep underneath the railing. And notice how, as it sits right now, I'm sitting at about 42 inches, which is higher than what I want to off of the deck and so really the main way to adjust it now is to cut these balusters to length and so you have to figure out um, what is the length of your balusters that you want cut them all to length and then we want to figure out how to fasten them and so for this I'm going to be using on the bottom here uh, these R4 multi-purpose screws these GRKs and then I will also use a little bit of tight bond 3 exterior wood glue and then for the top I'm using these uh, GRK uh, finish or or trim screws and so with these they have a small little head on them and when I drill through the top of the railing those holes will basically disappear I'm going to cut all 16 balusters at the same time I just used a 2x6 to basically line them all up 
and then I am going to be taking off two inches from all of them to give me a finished uh, railing height of 40 inches instead of 42. And so we'll lift up our guard here. So I have all my screws in the line here on the bottom. You can see how I screwed into the point where I know where it's going to penetrate through. I'm using a paint stick because as you can see, if I have the paint stick on the bottom and the top, that puts it at approximately the middle uh, where I want it to be. And so that'll make it nice and fast. I'll put a little bit of glue there and I'll pop it right on top of where that screw's coming out and then I'll screw it in. After that screw is tightened, make sure it's rotated to the proper position because once the glue dries, it's basically going to lock it from being able to be rotated and then just wipe any excess glue off and you're good to go on to the next one. One way to do it is to carefully lift it into position without putting the top rail on. And you can see how the two by fours are being used as spacers to hold it for the sweep. And then you can also see how I have two screws coming in on both sides at an angle ready to secure it to the posts. For the top handrail, you might want to pre-drill and use a countersink bit just to prevent splitting. Now we can come through after the top is secured to the posts and we can put in these balusters with a trim head screw from the top, making sure that it's plumb. So this is how the first railing section turned out. It might actually be easier to build the entire railing and then screw it into place. I do like the ability, however, to be able to come in and make sure all of my balusters are perfectly plumb uh, after the fact. And also notice how these joints here are all filled with glue and possibly a little bit of sawdust as well, uh, just to make those joints nice and strong, even though there's two screws each already. And then also notice on the top here, these trim head screws aren't very noticeable, especially as time goes on. And if you wanted to, you could fill them as well. To build the railing sections more efficiently, you can do repetitive steps at the same time. So for example, you can measure and cut all of your 2x4s, you can come along and sand the corners, then you can space out your balusters, and then you can cut your balusters at least 12 at a time, so you can get an idea of how this can speed up the process. When you're ready to lift it up in place, if you just lift it by one baluster, you're going to probably torque it and rip it right off of that screw. And so running a small board underneath and then lifting on all the balusters at the same time and distributing that force over all the balusters will definitely help. It also helps if you have different drills slash impact drivers to avoid having to change the bits all the time. In the areas like this, you'll notice how the railing sections get a little bit more complicated. And so in this case, we're going from a flat section to an angled section. Uh, and then over here in this case, we were actually going from an angled section to another angled section. And so for that, all we really need to do is just kind of notch out our railing. At least that's how I chose to do it. And it really is not too big of a deal. I just made a template and then I measured from basically the point on one side to the point on the other side and then I just put my little template on there and cut out what I needed for the notch and I slid the railing section right in. When it comes to building the stairs for the deck you can buy pre-made stair stringers which are nice with brackets and it'll attach nice and easy to your deck. Remember that the rise is going to be about seven and a half inches and the run is gonna be about 10 inches for each step. And so for my case though, I realized I didn't need two steps. I'm only gonna do one step. And what I'll do is pour a concrete pad with the extra concrete I have here. I have a nice concrete finishing tool to make a nice edge on that little concrete pad that I'm going to pour. And I'm gonna pour it so that I have the perfect height which will accommodate one step. And so this will be the step that I'm basically just gonna build a little box for, and that will be all I need. If you need to customize your stairs a little bit more, you can cut your own stair stringers. And for that, you will just need to do some calculations of the slope and the exact rise and run that you need and the exact number of stairs that you need. And then you can use stair gauges on a framing square 
and then just mark it out on a 2x12 and basically just make your own cuts and customize the stairs the way that you want them. It's just a little bit more difficult. So this is what the deck looks like from the side and so you can see how I can actually modify the ground in order to get kind of to the height that I want and then I'll actually pour that concrete pad and I'll measure down so that I get the exact height that I need for one stair. Since I am only going with one step I really don't need to worry about a railing. Uh, anything three or more steps I would consider building a railing uh, down uh, and then having two additional posts and two additional railing sections for the staircase itself. Um, but I'm only going with one step, I don't need to worry about that. Also notice that I have installed some skirting here and some drainage pathways for water. And for the skirting it's quite easy. I just used some uh, fence picket, uh, which are about a dollar or two a piece. Uh, for like, you can get it in like four foot or six foot lengths. And so it's nice cheap skirting uh, that can go around and it kind of gives a little bit of a waterfall effect. And for that I just basically used uh, two of the camo screws, the trim head screws uh, in each. Now that's really not a big deal for a small situation like we have here. But as we come around to the front of the deck, it's going to get bigger and bigger. And so we might actually need a little structure towards the bottom. But that's the basic idea with skirting. Also for this deck, I'm actually going to go with a gate here. And so I'll just use some scrap 2x4 and some scrap balusters and just build a nice little gate for this 36 inch opening. And I will attach it with some hinges uh, on this side so that it can swing open. And then I'll just have a latch there. Now some people have a wheel attached to the gate as well. I'm probably not going to do that. If your hinges are sturdy enough, you don't really need a wheel. I want to install an additional light to illuminate the other side of the deck right in between those two windows there. I plan on running an outdoor wire through the soffit into the attic. And then after that, coming through the attic and eventually tapping in to this light ideally because that way this switch here will control all of the lights outside. I already added an additional two recessed lights here on the inside and so what I'm doing is I want to be able to feed a wire up uh, from the attic down into this hole and then from this hole I can get a little bit of a better grab and hopefully feed it down through this stud cavity into this uh, junction box here. You can also have your wife get in the crawl space here and feed it down for you. I'll use the same procedure I used for the recessed lights. I'll come down here. Uh, I probably have to cut a new hole here. You can see how I wasn't quite done patching uh, the previous hole anyway. And then come down into that electrical box. So you can see now what it looks like and you can see where that other wire comes down into this stud cavity. We're going to try to fish it through here using my big arm to try to stuff it down correctly and then having my wife find it with her fingers and pull it out. Awesome. So my wife pulled this wire and got as much slack as she needed to get to the electrical box down there. Now I can install a junction box up here and then uh, tap into it from the wire coming from the soffit and then I will be good to go. So now I come to the circuit breaker panel and I find the one that says living room outlet lights, which is number one, which is right here. And I'll go ahead and turn that off so that I can work safely and I'll confirm that there's no electricity to that electrical box before I start working. So the electricity has been turned off and we took the electrical box cover off. I disassembled the switches, which is the one that we're going to tap into. We need to now run this wire down through the wall and into this box. So I now have the new wire in the box and you can see this is 14-2 wire which means it's 14 gauge and you can use your wire cutters with the 14 uh, gauge little slot and that allows you to just easily kind of strip off that little piece so that we can hook into this switch over here. We're going to do that for the black wire as well. So we have the bare wire coming to the green side and that is the ground which sends any electrical charge that's excess uh, to the ground. And so we'll have that tied in with the other grounds as well. 
And then we have over here the hots or the black wires. Now when this switch is in the off position, it does not allow electricity to kind of flow between those two points. And so that's what the switch does is it allows that connection to happen when you flip it on. And so we'll tie into the black wire here. And then the white wire uh, right here is going to be tied in with all of the other white wires. Sometimes it's called the common or neutral. Uh, and so that allows the full circuit to take place. And so we'll come in and uh, with a big wire nut on that. So now I'll go ahead and drill a hole through the soffit so that I can get a wire into this unit here. And I will attach all my white wires together and I'll attach the black wires together and the ground wires together. And I'll make sure uh, that no water can penetrate into these connections. Uh, because this is outdoors, we want to take a little bit more caution. Even though it is going to be tucked under the soffit, there could still be uh, some moisture and definitely weather that it's exposed to. So we want to be a little bit more careful than usual. So I just drilled my hole with a half inch bit and I will shove up my outdoor wire. And when I wire it in to the device, I want to make sure to use some exterior uh, silicone to kind of seal everything up. So you can see the wire coming up from right there and we're going to pull that wire through and attach it to the other wire with the junction box here in the attic and we will be good to go. You can definitely see though that it's a pain to get to that location. We're also going to hook up this outdoor security camera through the same hole and we will tap into an outlet that's up in the attic. As you can see I'm going to tap into this electrical box for my electricity to come off of with a new wire for a new outlet. All right, so I have my wire coming from that switch feeding power to this outlet, which is independent of that switch. And then I have the wire coming from over there, coming up into here, and the wire coming from the outdoor light coming up into here. Those two wires are basically just spliced with wire nuts. They're not connected to the outlet at all. And then this wire, like I said, coming from the other location gives power here and I'm checking it to make sure that it works and this is the plug for my camera uh, which I had to run an extension cord for and this is the light just to check to make sure it's working. I just turned the electricity back on. I'm not going to put the cover back on yet just in case I have to rewire it. I want to be careful not to touch anywhere inside but I'm going to carefully flip this switch and we'll see what happens. So we'll go here we go on, off, on, off, and it seems to be doing good. So the project is done. I now have a security camera and two security lights that are controlled by my switch in the living room. Here's a look at the deck so far from the other side. So as you can see, this side is not completed yet but I think you get a good idea of what's involved in building the deck. And so I have to finish the railing. I have to finish this jut out. I wanna finish the skirting around the deck. I'm gonna put that gate in and you'll see how this needs to be finished here, the railing around here. Some pieces of the border also need to be finished, you'll see, and we also want to come around to spots like this and we want to sand them and just kind of get rid of any marks like that. And then we want to do basically one final cleaning, uh, maybe with a pressure washer of the deck. And then we want to decide whether or not we want to stain it, but definitely seal it. And so after the deck is clean and dry, we will seal it all up and we are good to go. And so I hope that this video really helped you get a good idea of what's involved in building a deck. And if it did help you, make sure to smash that like button, comment, share, and subscribe for more videos related to construction. We'll see you in the next one.